Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we begin Unit 2 by examining the distribution or organization of the population of our planet. If you recall, distribution is typically composed of three characteristics, density, concentration, and pattern. The world contains nearly eight times more people than it did just 200 years ago. Population density has increased significantly since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Approximately two-thirds of the world's people are clustered in just four regions. South Asia, which recently became the largest of our four population clusters. Cities like Delhi in India and Karachi in Pakistan are meta-cities with more than 20 million residents, while Mumbai and Kolkata in India, Dhaka in Bangladesh, and Lahore in Pakistan are megacities with more than 10 million people. Even with these very large urban areas, nearly two-thirds of South Asia's population are farmers living in rural areas. East Asia is the next largest cluster. This region focuses on the eastern part of the world's most populous country, China, as well as Taiwan, Japan, and the Korean Peninsula. Western Europe is the largest cluster outside of Asia. Many people live in high-density urban areas like London, Paris, Berlin, and Rome but the population has been shrinking in more than a dozen European countries. And rounding out the big four is Southeast Asia, where more than half of this region's population lives in just two island countries, Indonesia and the Philippines. So what factors contributed to the current population distribution that we see on this map? Throughout the history and continuing today, people tend to live in moderate climates with fertile soil that supports agricultural production. Areas that are too hot or too cold, too dry or too wet, are unable to effectively produce enough food to support a significant population. People also tend to live at lower elevations, which again supports agricultural production but it also makes it easier to transport goods. Deltas and river valleys like the Yangtze and Yellow in East Asia, as well as the Indus and Ganges in South Asia, provide nutrient-rich soil that can support large populations. And coastal areas provide greater access to trade and economic opportunities, especially in an increasingly globalized world. Those economic opportunities have drawn people to cluster in higher densities in port cities and areas with economic potential. Populations are growing in areas where there are abundant job opportunities and higher wages. Areas of political and religious significance have also drawn significant populations. Capitals of countries, as well as holy sites around the world, have seen populations grow as people want to be near influential areas. But as you can see, the global population is not uniformly distributed. People have increasingly clustered in cities, in urban landscapes. These cities may have millions or even tens of millions of people in a relatively small area. In fact, 75% of the world's population lives on just 5% of the land. So now let's take a look at some ways that we can better understand the relationship between population and the physical landscape we inhabit. The first and most basic measurement is known as arithmetic density sometimes called crude density or just simply population density. Arithmetic density is the total number of people divided by the total land area. 
This metric tells us how crowded an area is. But it's known as crude density because it does not account for land that's difficult to live on or is uninhabitable. This metric does not provide any information about how clustered or dispersed a population is. For example, the global arithmetic density is about 115 people per square mile. But we know that the population is not uniformly distributed, so numbers can vary widely by country. So let's take a look at our map. What type of map is this? What's our scale of analysis? How is the data grouped? And is arithmetic density, in this case, total population per square kilometer, a good indicator of development? Bring those answers to class tomorrow. So now for some examples. Mongolia has an arithmetic density of 1.7 people per square kilometer, or 4.3 people per square mile. On the same continent, Bangladesh has 890 people per square kilometer, or 2,300 people per square mile, considerably more than the global average. So does that mean that Bangladesh is overpopulated? Does Mongolia have an abundance of food? Arithmetic density doesn't tell us those things. The density metric that can tell us a lot more about these types of questions is known as physiological density. Physiological density is the number of people per unit of area of arable land, which is land suitable for agriculture. Arithmetic density tells us how crowded an area is, regardless of the quality of land. But physiological density excludes land that isn't able to grow crops, like deserts, mountains, or swamps, and calculates how many people must be supported per aerial unit of agriculturally productive land. The higher the physiological density, there is greater pressure put on the arable land to produce food. And if countries cannot produce enough food domestically or within the country, then they may be forced to import food. For example, Egypt and Japan both have large disparities between their arithmetic and physiological densities. So while both countries supplement their food supply with fishing, it's easier for Japan to pay for imported food due to their higher level of development. But it's important to note that neither arithmetic nor physiological density explains how fertile and productive the arable land really is. A few examples. Now, the stats that I'm going to give you are in square miles rather than square kilometers. So the numbers won't match up with the key on this choropleth map, but the general message conveyed in the data and the choropleth map are the same. You don't need to write down these statistics, but listen to the general patterns and trends that exist for these countries. Iceland has an arithmetic density of eight people per square mile but a physiological density of almost 700 people per square mile of arable land because only 1.2% of their total land area is arable. That's because Iceland is found at a higher latitude and thus is very cold. The United States has an arithmetic density of 84 people per square mile with a physiological density of almost 500 people per square mile. Despite having the third largest population, the U.S. has a very large land area, of which about 17% is considered arable. Bangladesh, once again, has an arithmetic density of almost 3,000 people per square mile, but a physiological density of almost 5,000 people per square mile. Bangladesh currently has the eighth largest population in the world, and while nearly 60% of their land is arable, much of it's at low elevation. So if sea levels rise, arable land could be lost 
and more pressure will be placed on the land that remains to feed many people. The United Arab Emirates has an arithmetic density of about 300 people per square mile, but a physiological density of over 60,000 people per square mile of arable land. And that's because only 0.5% of their total land area is arable. We mentioned that Japan has a large disparity between arithmetic and physiological density. With an arithmetic density of nearly 1,000 people per square mile, their physiological density is over 8,000 people per square mile. And that gap is likely to widen because the best agricultural land is in southern Japan, where its biggest cities are. Finally, we close with Egypt. With an arithmetic density of 226 people per square mile and a physiological density over 8,000 people per square mile of arable land. Less than 3% of Egypt's total land area is considered arable, with most of it located along the Nile River and its delta, as we can see in this aerial photograph. It's believed that 98% of Egypt's population lives on just 3% of its land. And Cairo, the largest city and its capital, is situated on the delta for the Nile. And as the city continues to grow, the best farmland is being lost to urbanization. We're going to look at this trend in more detail in class. Our last metric indicates the efficiency of a country's farmers. Agricultural density is the ratio of the number of farmers to the total amount of land suitable for agriculture. This compares the number of farmers to the amount of farm land, or as we've used all lecture, arable land. This metric tends to reveal more about a country's wealth or level of development than about its population distribution. Notice that MDCs tend to have lower agricultural densities, while LDCs tend to have a higher agricultural density. It's not a perfect inverse correlation, but it's fairly strong. A high agricultural density, like we see in Asia, tells us that there are a high number of farmers using the farmland very intensively. Lots of people are working with their hands, tools, and animals. That food is likely meant to feed the farmer's family or their close community, what we will define later in the year as subsistence agriculture. A low agricultural density means that there aren't many farmers. But those farmers often use big machines to help cover extensive land areas. They can feed many people because the food is harvested and sold to markets, a form of agriculture we will define as commercial agriculture. And that is where we will leave things for tonight. Have a good evening, everyone, and I'll see you all back in class.